Mitchell Swartz. What is it that actually enables successful mass energy transfer in cold fusion systems? This paper will report that it is synchronization of deuterons in vacancies in highly loaded palladium, which enables cold fusion to work. The field has 34 years of successful data showing excess heat from cold fusion systems. This includes formation of de novo helium-4, a loss of deuterium to enable this, as well as the appearance of unique anti-Stokes spectra and a radio frequency deuterium line at 327 megahertz. Here are a few examples of excess heat from cold fusion systems. The first shows excess heat on the right from a fusor type system, which has heavy water with no added salts, with a platinum anode and a palladium cathode. On the left, we can see that the thermal output matches the input to the ohmic thermal control. On the other hand, the fusor is giving excess heat at two input levels, and we can see that in the integrated energies, there is excess heat in the fusor type system, but not in the ohmic control. Here we see in the preloaded dry nanotype cold fusion systems, on the left is the ohmic control on the right is the cold fusion system. Again, the OMA control has an output that matches the input, whereas we can see true excess heat, which is reproducible from the Nanor type system. We can see a power gain up to 12 here and an energy gain on the order of that magnitude. Here we see the present output of a dry preloaded nanner type component. The OMA control has a matching input and output power on the left. And on the right, we can see a gain of approximately 300% with 12 watts output. Here we can see in overlapping coherent Raman spectroscopy, the emission between 525 and 545 nanometers by a cold fusion nanotype component that is off, that is electrically driven both in the desired active mode and in the non-desired avalanche mode that causes no excess heat. The important point is that there are two states in driven cold fusion systems and one of them does not work. This slide shows the of an active nanor type component beginning here and continuing in time in this direction. What we see is a very high Q emission near 327 megahertz from this active system. Here we see the emission in the region of 327 megahertz. And here we see the line appearing when the nanotype type component is only driven a little above one volt. These super hyperfine lines appear when we raise the voltage up above approximately 30 volts, and we will discuss that shortly. The important point here, what is found is that during mazing, if the voltage is raised slightly, a number of sidebands appear. Here we can see that at two volts at the bottom, there is only the single maser line. But when the voltage was raised to 15 volts in the middle, multiplicity appears within the high Q emissions. These super hyperfine lines reveal the location of where the deuterons are. Here we can see analysis of these super hyperfine lines and their locations and intensities where we can see there is a match 
for face centered cubic vacancy. This is located below the image itself, and we can see as a second example that if we plot where the locations should have been if it was a body centered cubic, there's nothing there. The match is for face centered cubic vacancies. That is where the deuterons exist prior to their synchronization and formation of de novo helium-4. We will now look at the super hyperfine lines in the radio frequency region emitted by our MOAC, an aqueous nickel ordinary water platinum cold fusion system shown here. This slide shows the output of the MOAC in the radio frequency region at 327 megahertz. On the left on the bottom is what is seen when the system is off. In the middle, it is driven electrically with 10 volts at 45 milliamperes, and on the right, driven with 20 volts, 200 milliamperes. The two on the right give excess heat, and the sidebands are shown up above as a function of time, which is falling. Here is the analysis for the nickel ordinary water system. And you can see that there is a match for face centered cubic, but in fact, it is more complicated. The nickel ordinary water system demonstrates body centered cubic vacancies as well as face centered cubic vacancies heralding new metallurgic phases. Here we see the side bands of the Maser line at 327 megahertz obtained from the nickel ordinary water system. The appearance is unlike anything else seen that we have seen on Earth over the last six years, and it is only associated with these excess heat producing cold fusion systems. Most interesting here is that notice where there is a star, there happens to also be a pulsing signal. These pulses take place over minutes, and we can see, in fact, that other sidebands are interacting. There are several implications from the pulsatile super hyperfine lines. One, there is in phase synchronization. Two, there is a recognition of coherence in the maser output. Finally, there is a recognition now that synchronization plays a role in achieving the excited state of helium-4. Here, some of the sidebands were chosen and shown over time that there is some kind of synchronization observed, though it was unclear how when this was presented in Assisi three years ago. Synchronous behavior is ubiquitous and important. We see it in orbital physics and astronomy. We see it in medicine. We see it in coupled pendulum clocks, and we see it in animals and in physical systems such as cold fusion. We see the synchronous behavior everywhere when we look for it, in animals, fireflies, all around us. We see synchronous behavior in teams. We see synchronous behavior everywhere. Synchronous behavior is even shown here between two laterally coupled diode lasers, shown for five different distances between the emitters. One good example of synchronous behavior is the coupling of oscillator clocks, first used by Christian Huggins to handle the navigational longitude problem. These clocks were coupled by a larger mass to which they were connected and would synchronize over half an hour. Understanding synchronizations came long after Huggins. It required many tools that we have today. And one tool that is for the future is Hoff Fiber Bundle Topologic Solutions. These are called Hoff Vibration 
and they're used in physics and medicine. The tool is used here to consider synchronization of deuterons as the applied electric field intensity continuously increases energy to them until they achieve the excited state of helium-4. In Hopf vibration, the solution is analyzed in four dimensions, and that is because we use X, Y, and Z, and time. This is handled by two complex numbers, and from them, we have the projection into three dimensions, which is what we see. So now it is time to use Hopf vibration analysis to examine the super hyperfine line pulsation seen in the radio frequency emissions from active cold fusion systems. In successful cold fusion, LANR, the reactions are driven by the applied electric field intensity, which creates a forced, turbulent deuteron oscillator flow. This occurs for two reasons. One, the deuterons are ionized bosons and are identical and can therefore interchange amongst themselves without any change in the system. The other reason they can do this is because they are interacting in a very well-defined range of frequencies, free of noise, as we can see with the high Q radio frequency maser that they output at the deuterium line. Successful cold fusion begins with loading. We do that electrically because we get the highest levels of loading. The metallurgy is complex and well studied, involving at least two phases, which can be seen here. Successful cold fusion requires high loading. These occur in vacancies as has been seen by the hyperfine lines from the radio frequency emissions. The high loading is necessary, but the problem is that irreversible reactions are wrought on the lattice structure, including dislocations, fractures, fissures, and volume changes, some of which can be irreversible. In step two of this process of deuteron synchronization on the way to fusion, the applied electric field intensity creates an electrically forced turbulent oscillator flow. This initially starts as a smooth, low-level process, but energy continues to be transferred to the synchronized deuterons, eventually increasing the energy until the double Hopf bifurcation. In addition, we know now that as active cold fusion occurs, Anti-Stokes reveals the presence of an acoustic phonon population inversion and phonon gain. This will further add to the energy available to the synchronized deuterons. At the double Hopf bifurcation, the synchronizing deuterons have several paths they may follow. One is to return back to the ground state. Most of the other paths are not available. And then there are in-phase and anti-phase periodic solutions. When examined, three of them have the opportunity for mass energy transfer. With Hopf vibration analysis, the deuteron coupling is examined dynamically on a breathing two-dimensional torus-shaped surface. This is the synchronous deuteron fusion phase space upon which we watch the interactions. This will reveal quite a bit from the trajectory. Here we see the toroidal breathing mode solution statically. I will show in a minute the video. And we can see there are planar projections. We can see there is a Poincare map on the right side, which has a one-dimensional closed curve. This graph shows the nuclear isospin singlet manifold for helium-4 and the entry of two deuterons 
up to the excited level of helium-4 by these synchronization reactions. We can see that the applied electric field intensity raises the energy, thereby enabling an irreversible, if we're lucky and see the excess heat, an irreversible reaction through internal conversion whereby the lattice receives phonons in a cooperative process and that is the excess heat. This table shows the energy levels of excited helium-4, the first, second, and third and higher levels, as well as their angular momentum, parity, isospin, etc. What's important is that these are located between 20 million electron volts and 22 MeV, and these are not low energy. These are, in fact, high energy, capable of generating penetrating ionizing radiation, capable of curing patients of cancer, cation, patient, uh, capable of even producing pear production. Cold fusion is high energy, not low energy. The next series of slides show what happens when the paired deuterons achieve the excited helium-4 level. The emission of penetrating gamma radiation is spin forbidden. The restriction is only lifted at the higher temperatures of hot fusion. The emissions of neutrons is a branch that is forbidden to cold fusion from the excited helium-4 state because it is located 1 MeV higher. KT only provides 1 25th of an electron volt, and this is therefore not achievable. One of the most important differences between hot and cold fusion is the Bremsstrahlung. And what we see is that almost all of the terms are temperature dependent. When we correct the temperatures to what actually exists for cold fusion, we find that the forward radiation drops by 18 orders of magnitude. For one coulomb used for fusion at one meter, in hot fusion you get three times 10 to the 19th grays, which falls to about three times 10 to the minus four grays for cold fusion. That is why the graduate students lived. There is only one way out, except back to the ground state, and that is through the irreversible 20 MeV plus transition, which is enabled by the lattice, wherein the excited state goes to the ground state of helium generating even more phonons, further enabling these reactions. In the end, successful cold fusion creates a low momentum helium nucleus. In addition, the fuson is the quasi-particle, which coherently couples the megavoltage energy of the excited helium state to the lattice. And so we come to the final take-home points. So what we see is that in cold fusion, unlike hot fusion, synchrony of the loaded deuterons is what enables the cold fusion through electrically forced turbulent oscillator flow. Unlike hot fusion, the mechanism in cold fusion is relational and productive rather than confrontational targeting and destructive. Unlike hot fusion with one deuteron hitting the other, in this series of reactions, the deuterons are bosons and they interact in synchrony, accepting energy from the applied electric field, thereby circumventing and making moot the Coulomb barrier. This then is the difference between hot and cold fusion. Hot fusion has a sudden impact, a brute targeting, and a high temperature versus cold fusion, which works by deuteron synchronization, where the applied electric field intensity causes an electrically forced turbulent oscillator flow, leading to the excited
helium-4 state. Thank you for coming.